Now I'm joined by financial analyst and CEO of Finance with Mukta, Mukta Mohammed, to review some of the past week's top stories. Mukta, good morning to you. Thank you. Really lovely me. to have you on the show this morning. Thank you. Of course, it's been a very eventful week, but very, very you know, we had such great news, we had to repeat it again. And I'm talking, of course, about uh, the appointment of Dr. Adoro Murji as the GMD and CEO for Zenith Bank. Of course, very, you know, great milestone, not just for Zenith Bank, for the banking sector in Nigeria as well. Let's get your take on it. Well, it's great news, but again, yeah, but again. I mean, maybe it was overshadowed because it was after the International Women's Day, but we have sure. some other, the group GMD of Assets Holding is a woman, the, C, the, the, the Managing Director of Fidelity Bank is a woman, the Managing Director of GTB is a woman, Sun Trust Bank a woman, Union Bank a woman. So it's like the women are already taking over the financial stake. But I think, I think this made it so much noise, um, noise because, I can't, like I said, we're coming from the International Women's Day. And then coupled with, with our outstanding achievement of being the, D, the Deputy Managing Director to 2016, I think our achievements speak volume for her. But again, congratulations to the women. For the, like I said, they're already taking over the, the financial space, right? the banking space. We have up to like um, 11 of them there as the CEOs of their various establishments. So congratulations to her. And also the shareholders of Zenith Bank are excited about her coming. Maybe they're looking at what has happened in Fidelity Bank since um, the current Fidelity Bank CEO took over from a low of four naira to a high of about 10 naira. So maybe they are looking at such impact will be felt also in Zenith Bank, knowing that Zenith Bank is already doing very well and bringing somebody like her that have the experience and have been in the bank for 26 years that is commendable. Uh, absolutely commendable. And, you know, in the spirit of, of Women's Month, we're still in that energy, of course. And it's a good thing you highlighted the fact that there are quite a number of, across the banking sector in Nigeria, yeah. we've seen the, you know, the emergence of more of female CEOs. But let's get very quickly from you how you rate the performance. It's not just about celebrating that women are there, but let's talk about how those women are performing. They are doing very well. Like I said, the um, Zenit and Fidelity Bank, for, for example, she have moved that stock from about four naira when she came in and also about 10 naira, and you could see the organic growth in terms of their balance sheet, what has happened to Fidelity Bank ever since. GTB, coming from a major GTB bank, the current um, um, MD of the bank, subsidiary of GTCO, she's also doing very well. So if you look at their third quarter results, this has also been fantastic. You look at Citibank also, it's been managed by a woman, also doing very, very well in terms of expansion, in terms of the creativity that they are bringing in, into their branches here in Nigeria. Uh, you have a Lutos Bank, another new bank that have come in that seems to be pu pulling strings left and also being headed by a man. Some trust also is like the new, the newer versions of these banks come up with women being there. Union Bank also, we have the woman, if in spite of the challenges you've seen in Union Bank, especially the acquisition, you could see also a good synergy moved in that space to have brought them to the depth. So they've, they've done very, very well. And also not forgetting that there are times that the first bank was also headed by a woman as the chairman of the bank. Um, currently, I mean, Access Bank also was headed by a woman as the chairman of the bank. So definitely the women force, and when you look at the tenure of these two women, when they were chairman of this bank, you could see the kind of performance those banks have said. So they've done very, very well in terms of their performance. And then if you look at the organic growth they bring in there, and again, this step finance, especially when it came at a point that this terrain, the financial terrain was going through a lot of turbulence. Absolutely. So they're worth their metal. It's very refreshing Definitely. to hear that. Definitely. And uh, we hope to see more, you know, a lot more uh, ripple go through that space. But of course, let's come back here to a topic we cannot ignore. You know, analysts see the Naira advancing by as much as 25% against the dollar this year. Let's talk about that. Fantastic news. If you're in Nigeria, if you're a businessman, and uh, we've seen that also happening of recent. I've said it always. The challenge with the Naira was not because of banners. The challenge with the Naira was not because of speculators. The challenge with the Naira has been liquidity. And I've always said it, that if you decide to pump in liquidity into the system and um, decide to pay the backlog, it's form of pouring of liquidity into the system. And immediately the CBN came up with that news that we have verified, paid off verified backlog. We saw the ripple effect within the first day, both in the parallel and the official market. So it's good news, and I, I mean that's not the end of it. It, it has to; they have to come up. They're not just paying up this um, um, backlog. They must be innovative way of attracting foreign investors, portfolio investors, especially Nigeria and the diaspora. You must commend them if you look at the figure given by CBN thus far. They seems to be the one pumping in the green bag into the Nigerian economy, and that is for me is a very good thing. So going forward, we need to look at oil. Oil is improving. Our crude oil sale is improving. 
And I think a game changer will be, um, if you look at the data from Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, it shows that almost over 75 of our FX pressure come from the importation of refined petroleum product. And if anything is to go back by April, NMPC assuring us that um, Portaco refinery will come to strengthen, that will reduce the pressure on the Naira. And we're still waiting for the longer with the Dangote refinery also. That also could be a game changer that will bring down the pressure on the Naira, especially to the dollar. So commendable, and hopefully the Naira will move in the right direction. We all have said that the Naira is undervalued. I think it's time now to Naira, the Naira to take its full value with some of the policy of the CBM. It's yeah, very certainly very promising. You know, exciting, uh, but of course the question has always really been hinged about sustainability and moving forward. Of course, we look at the FX reforms that the CBN has implemented in order to just free up the Naira and boost some local dollar liquidity. Uh, let's look at the long term. You know, of course we can see it working, but let's. the question is about sustainability, shelf life. How much further can we go? Yeah, I mean, the problem with Nigerian government or the CBN has always been not maintaining the rate. When there is crisis, there's always innovativeness coming from them. But again, after that time, when they've learned steady, we seem to forget all we did to bring it to stability, and we, stop, we seem to forget all we need to do to even bring it down one again or maintain that stability. Instead, we have external shocks. We have four ways of uh, attracting effects into this economy, crude oil, um, Nigerian diaspora, foreign direct investment, and um, foreign portfolio investment. Now, those are the four key areas now. They will begin to look at other areas that can boost our economy, definitely. And that is where the physical side comes to be. The monetary side could do what they have to do, that what they have done now. It's not left for the physical side to begin to come up with innovation that will attract more investment into the Nigerian economy. And also begin to look at policy that would drive export out of this country, not paying this service to it. We've been through this route before. We come out and the Naira is stable for three years, four years. And after that, once there's an external shock, that doesn't have to, that crude oil sale comes down, then we go back to status quo. So I think what they should do in the short term, stability is key. So you maintain those stability. But in the long term, what you need to do, you have to do. You need to begin to attract genuine investors into the Nigerian economy and also begin to build the bedrock of the Nigerian economy, not just in the oil sector, but in so, or all other sectors, the non oil sector. If we are able to maintain that with good physical policies, then we are in for a stable exchange rate, the advance of any external shock. Right, so very commendable, but we need to see some more cohesion and, of course, uh, be able to push this further to the external communities to, for us to see more long-term growth. That sounds very, um, it sounds very promising. Now let's look at the European Union boosting its ties with Egypt. 7.5 billion euros aid package. Is there more to this? Yeah, more to it because um, just like the reform we are doing here, they decide to do their own reform. But they did it in a different way. That's why I said sometimes you also need to make them know that you are not begging. What Egypt did was that um, they said their currency, they, they wanted them to liberalize their currency just like what we did, float your currency instead of the managed system. And they said, okay, fine, we're going to float this currency. But they looked at their, inter, their, their FX, their foreign reserve. They realized that the key driver of your foreign reserve have to be tourism. And because of the challenge from COVID, the tourism sector in Egypt have not... Um, boosted the way they want. So what did they do? They sat down and looked at it closely and said, you know, what we'll do now is we'll tell the IMF we need liquidity. And the IMF decided to improve liquidity of $10, $9 billion to the economy. So they sat down and looked at, okay, $9 billion to the economy. If you increase that liquidity, then we'll be able to do what you want us to do. Because then, they, because like I keep saying, no CBN will just allow its currency to float. They will also have a way of intervening, especially when they see their currency is undervalued, like what we experienced in Nigeria. So when that funds came in, they, they immediately they did that. They, they devalued their currency. The first day of that announcement, floating of their currency, whatever you call it, that devaluation of floating, the currency lost about 50%. The second day, because of the, 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 the liquidity they had from, uh, from the World Bank and the, um, the IMF, then there was stability. And the, the currency gains about 30% of what it had lost, about 20%. And then the EU looked at it as most EU nations do business with, 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 with Egypt, especially in the area of tourism, and said, okay, we'll also boost your liquidity by 7.6 uh, billion euros. And that, again, is helping them cope with the challenge that EU is trying to be a big brother to East Africa because of the crisis in Palestine, because between the Palestine and the... And, 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 and the Israelis. And Egypt seems to be the gateway whereby they will receive a lot of this aid and support. So they needed to intervene. They come. So that's a good way of 
trying to manage your system, getting it, but now using this it to grow your economy. Yeah, you know, I like the analogy of a big brother because it really pretty much describes, you know, the European governments have been quite concerned about instability yeah. with Egypt for a while because it's a country that struggled to raise foreign currency and, of course, the effect of that based on, you know, economic adversity is migration, yeah, migration out of that. Yes. So that's another key issue. But do you see this being a sustainable response to addressing the migration issue? I think so. Okay. I think so in the long run. It's going to be because now when you, you, you just said it, you talk... When you said the EU now, they are looking at security. Remember, they have issues uh, where tourists were attacked. And so those part of those security breaches that they will be picking in. Because we are not said what these aids are. We just said they are pumping about 7.3 billion euros into, into the digital economy. I'm sure the security aspect of it was also form part of it, largely part of it. Yeah, it's a really good impetus. And of course, we have to keep our eyes peeled and, uh, you know, hope for the very best over there. But now over to the world of tech. I love this part. You know, Apple is and its global dominance. Apple exploring a partnership with Google to leverage Gemini AI for iPhone features. What can we expect to see this? And doesn't this give it some sort of commanding effect for, you know, Apple? Because they already have some sort of partnership existing, even for prompts on the iPhone already. I think um, Apple is, is beginning to monopolize that smartphone space. Just yesterday, the Ministry of Justice in the United States was suing as Apple for anti-terrorism trust rule. They are not um, compatible with other network. They seem to want to take over the market. And before then, this uh, before this case came up, they were already partnered with Google. You must understand that Google actually paid about 18 billion to Apple every year as um, as a means of having their own um, 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 Google platform on Apple app, Apple smartphone. As yeah. So definitely it's a game changer for Apple. It will expand their market value. It's also a game changer for Google because what is going to this partnership is going to, it, when, once you come into partnership, I'm sure that $18 billion that used to go in will have to come down or will, will have to be knocked off. And again, it's a win for Apple. I'm sure that's why Apple is so confident to challenge the Ministry of Justice in the United States that, look, we are not antitrust. We have partnership with others. We use other, others can use our product. We take, could use this Google as an example. I think it's a smart move from both, and both for Google, both for Apple. And I think it will grow the market share of Apple and also increase the bottom line of Google because what will happen is that 18 billion will not be added to the bottom line of Google rather than going to Apple alone. But this monopolization of intelligence, let's put it that way, is there, are there any threats to it again? No, I think Or is what, this just making think, business sense? It's just making business. And you look at artificial intelligence is the way to go. So Apple is beginning, before now everybody thought Apple would not be involved in artificial intelligence because it's supposed to be silent in that area. Now they are bringing in, in and they want to partner with Google who happened to be the key driver of artificial intelligence. So that also is an added advantage to them to remember that Google have partnered with Samsung already. And so, they, 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 so it's Apple trying to capture part of that market because if you do only with Samsung, then that means at a point, the, the generation we are moving are, are truly generation that believe in artificial intelligence. So uh, Apple is looking towards the future that if we have to be relevant, we need to key into artificial intelligence. I like that. So it's really business, making business sense and yeah, adding value, sense. creating value. Well, let's look at Cote d'Ivoire preparing to join OPEC. Now, this I found this very exciting news, uh, but there is a downside to it as well. But let's hear from you first. I, I, I don't know why Cote is excited about that OPEC. I don't know how much later of crude they produce to be part of OPEC. Um, they, found new old, uh, they found new deposits there. New deposits there that have not yet been, 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 um, been uh, um, I mean, um, will I say extracted yet. And okay. So that is a good news for them. Then when you look at the competitor that another African country, Angola, pulled out of OPEC. That was the downside I was referring to. So why are we yeah. now seeing OPEC coming into Great Cote d'Ivoire? I, I think um, it's good news for Cote d'Ivoire. But again, um, with Nigeria, we've seen that OPEC itself could be a hindrance to your going forward, but it depends. This is since they are finding they are finding new 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 um, 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 deposits. deposits that could help them. OPEC helping them come in there. I think that might be the strategy because OPEC may have all the technology that they have. Because if you are an OPEC nation, then they will need to help. And Cote d'Ivoire is just coming in deep, discovering this deposit because they have never been an oil producing nation. So they might just be looking at it that we need OPEC at this time point in time. 
to really help us shop this our deposit that we are finding, bring in the latest technology, and also look at the environmental impact because they don't have experience in those areas. Right. So you see it as more of a win for for the Ivorians, yeah, for Cote d'Ivoire, as opposed to it being a mutually beneficial situation. I think it's more win for them, especially if you are learning from the lessons from other African countries like Angola and also even Nigeria. You want to learn from them and then you want to make sure that you're not falling into the traps that these countries are falling into, especially with OPEC. I mean, in the sh like I said, in the short term, it's going to be beneficial, but we don't know what could have have off their sleeve. Maybe towards the long term, they will, they will say, okay, you've done all you want to do for us. It's time for us to even pull out, like right. what we've seen in Angola. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it would be really great to see the Ivorian petroleum sector actors really look into the Ivorian sedimentary bases, yeah. um, basin rather, and you know, really, really capitalize on this uh, extractive industry. So let's keep our eyes peeled on that one as well. And finally, over to you know, Southern African Botswana, where we'll begin to trade under AFTA in April. What do we make of that? Very quickly, please. Good news. Uh, we've said it. Um, African Continental Trade Agreement has not seen the light of day. They have the challenges, but we're having a, one of Africa's brightest economy trained to say, look, you know what? We want to be part of the African Continental Trade Agreement. We want to make sure we do more business with Africans, especially when you look at the sector that uh, Botswana are playing. I think for me, it's, it's good. It's a win for Africa. Finally, hopefully, we'll see major players like South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, other keeping into this. Oh, absolutely. So it'll be a great agreement. precursor. You know, we've had some all-round good news today. Mokhtar, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. We'll see you again very soon. Many thanks Thank for you. joining us.